Hello, Haik. Good Hello. to have you with us at Faces of Armenia. Thank you so much. So to start things off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are? I am Haik Vartanyan. I work at Birthright Armenia as an operations specialist. I organize the weekly excursions that we have, as well as many other events uh, that we hold throughout the year at Birthright and AVC. Uh, also, I am responsible for the office logistics of the uh, Birthright office. Okay, let's take one or two steps back. So, I assume you're Armenian born and raised here? Yes, I was born and raised here. Uh, born in Yerevan, actually, raised here. I lived a couple of years outside of the country, but mostly I lived here. Can you share a little bit about your experience of, uh, say, your first 15, 20 years of your life? How, how was Armenia back then and how did it develop to today? Well, that, that was the post-Soviet Union Armenia, so there wasn't much fun stuff going on. Uh, it was a very hard time for the country. Before that, we had all these hard years of war and uh, genocide and so on. And later, we had uh, the earthquake. When I was born, two days later, we had the Spitak earthquake, oh. which was also another hard uh, thing for Armenia. Uh, for, fortunately, thanks to the help from diaspora and many other countries, it's slowly getting better. Uh, but there's still yeah, a lot I mean, of work. The, the earthquake was really a decades-long issue. And yes, still today and still problems. today there are people who have not been provided with homes, which is a very, very difficult issue. So what makes me wonder, many people refer to the 90s so until the 2000s to the dark period, the yes. dark ages. You were a kid at the time. Yeah. How did you experience it? Well, uh, I was quite young then, but I have some vague memories of, I don't know, doing homework with candlelight, mm -hmm. not having electricity, not having water 24 hours a day, having to go uh, take water from outside uh, with buckets and bottles and things like that. It was a difficult time. Uh, there was no electricity, so there was no heating. And we almost all of the families had these uh, wood burning ovens yeah. or whatever those are called. Uh, buying wood or getting wood from somewhere else and burning that uh, for warmth and heat and so on. Uh, those exact, of course, those weren't the easiest years for Armenian people. So, but do you think in a way that also brought Armenians closer together? Of course, it also brought Armenians closer, but... Uh, it also uh, destroyed a lot of trees. Oh. So if you see Yerevan now, it looks completely differently than it used to. Oh, please, if please you... share a little bit because I think a number of us don't really have a picture. Yes, now, yes. Right? So that's that's the interesting thing. Um, it looks. To, it used to be much greener. There used to be trees in a lot of places where now there's nothing left, unfortunately. Uh, that's because people wanted to heat their homes and they would uh, go chop down trees oh. all around Yerevan, um, especially some forests in Nork. So there are some photos. If you look up all the Yerevan photos, I think there are a couple of Facebook groups too who, have, uh, who are collecting those photos. Please check those out. You will see an almost completely different Yerevan, which is completely green, full of trees, uh, which is not the case now, unfortunately. So, okay, so do you think there are two different development trajectories, one for the city of Yerevan and one for the people living in Yerevan mm. back from the 90s to today? Yeah, it's different. Uh, all of these people who had seen difficult times, uh, they have a different mindset than the next generation. They always... Okay, but that is a point, like a number of people told me, like, let, let's dwell on this a little bit. Uh -huh. How is the generational divide also in Armenians, among Armenians? Well, that's the thing. Uh, there's one generation that came from the Soviet Union, the elder generation, who lived throughout the Soviet Union, and uh, some of them still think that Soviet Union was one of the best things that happened to Armenia. Mm -hmm. And then there's the next generation who lived the post-Soviet era, which are my parents. Mm -hmm. And for them, it was a time for struggle. They struggled throughout their youth, bringing up children and so on. Uh, in order to be able to provide for their families because all of their jobs disappeared. Uh, we can almost say overnight, over a month, all of their jobs, 
all of their education didn't became so useless. Peter yes. was a call of joy, but also a call of sadness. A call of sadness, yes, because all of the things that we depended on the Soviet Union yeah. as a whole union, all of those things disappeared. So a lot of factories, overnight, overnight yeah. basically overnight, a lot of factories closed down because they wouldn't receive parts from other parts of Soviet Union. A lot of uh, work sites and so on, a lot, a lot of uh, village sovkhoz, they would call it, the... Uh, a lot of sovkhozes where they would keep the cattle and chickens and fowl and everything. All of those uh, broke down and uh, a lot of people ended up without work and a lot of well, well-educated people ended up without work and unable to find and unable to find work in the future years. So uh, it was basically a very tough time for the for the generation of my parents who had to basically figure out this independence thing and uh, how uh, how future Armenia is going to look like and what it will be for the people and also for the cities and so on. So how do you think that they cope and how does this translate into a unified Armenian identity? Going from education to learning new skills to just surviving? Yeah, uh, well, the the educational system continued on for a little while like that, but then of course uh, the European system stepped in with uh, all of these multiple choice uh, questions and things like that. That was the transition transition that I saw that was for me was a bit uh, surprising and uh, interesting was that before probably up to 8th or ninth grade, uh, all of my tests were not multiple choice. Mm. So you needed to know the subject yeah. to answer the question. You were not given some a good answer and some bad answers, which of course makes things much easier. If you have a question and you need to answer that exact question the way it is, it's much more difficult and you need to have the actual knowledge. For other places, you can just guess and have a lucky guess or have an educated guess mm -hmm. on multiple choice answers. So that's how the education suffered in Armenia a little bit, in my opinion. Of course, that's my opinion. A lot of people contradict to that, but I think it was um, it gave you much more uh, wider range of education if you didn't have all these multiple choice questions and uh, the and it didn't make life easier for you to study. But uh, one of those as and uh, one of the other many changes in the country was uh, of course the governmental system. Uh, there was the new government and um, a lot of people weren't happy with that. Some people were happy with that as in uh, probably every new government. So, but basically, based on your narrative, so to speak, right now there are three distinctive, very different generations. Yes. Post-Soviet uh, post Union, the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and then the new generation. The new generation, some of my generation, and later on, those are the confused generations that... Uh, okay, but it's they were They were born right in the middle of the transition, and after that, uh, which was... Uh, which was difficult. So if you have these very different people in the act as under the identity of one country, of one nation, how does it work? How does it play out peacefully? It's not like we had any other choice, honestly. <laughs> we were living in Armenia, we got what we wanted, we received independence, mm -hmm. and we were responsible for our own actions and uh, our own choices. Of course, there were some choices that we had to make that we didn't have the choice to make. Uh, uh, for example, uh, being partially dependent on Russia, Russian gas, uh, Russian uh, uranium to work the um, Metzamor nuclear factory yeah. and so on, nuclear plant. So there are some things that we became dependent on Russia and we are still dependent on that. As you know, a lot of uh, electricity in, in Armenia comes from Russian sources and uh, so on. Um, but that was something that Ar Armenia was actually able to uh, handle quite well. Interna international relationship, I think it managed to do quite well and stay friends both with the West and the East and Russia and juggle all of these countries quite well so far. Can you maybe also 
Tell us a little bit about your professional career. What did you do? How was it to find work? Yeah. So when I <clears throat> was about to graduate school, I uh, went to the States for one year as an exchange student. So that changed a bit my perspective on life and future. Because if you live in the States for one year, it looks like a completely different planet. Okay, but please, now, now we have something to dwell on. Uh -huh. What were your expectations of the States and then what was reality and how did it really change? Most, uh, most of my expectations were based on horrible stereotypes, of <laughs> course. When you go to a different country, okay. that's the first thing you know. Uh, but then you go into the country and fortunately I was very, very fortunate to have a very nice host family uh, in, uh, in Sterling in Virginia, ah. which was very interesting. And uh, I lived there for one whole year and it was, a, again, completely different planet. Uh, all of the things that I expected that would be was completely different. Um, Starting from basic things and uh, up to, of course, the high school life and so on. So it's like the perspectives were formed from the back in the days from the Cold War, from the Soviet influence. Yeah, Soviet yeah. So I basically came out of the Soviet Union. <laughs> I didn't know much of the Soviet Union, but from what I know. And, and then I lived in the States for one whole oh, year. Yeah. It's, it was a very fun contrast for me. Seeing all these uh, different things that I would have never seen, of course, in Armenia and in the Soviet Union. But uh, so when I finished that year, I came back to Armenia and uh, it was time to choose uh, the university and higher education and so on. And I was uh, and I wanted to at that time, I was very romantic and I wanted to become a lecturer in the Yerevan State University, uh, probably literature or foreign languages, I was going among those lines. So you were always good at English? Yes, I was always good with, uh, I was good with languages in general. Oh, okay. How many do you speak? Uh, I also speak French, uh, of course, Russian, Armenian, English, and a little bit of Spanish that I learned in high school. Oh, it's not bad. Not yeah, bad. it's not bad. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I entered the Yerevan State University for uh, literature and foreign languages department and I studied there for one year and uh, almost a year and then I went into the military service because when you turn 18 in Armenia wow. you go and become well, a soldier. It's always like this, it's always like this. Yes, and it's still like this um, unless you have a uh, very high marks in your university and I think they're slowly changing that too you go uh, and uh, you're uh, conscripted into the military for two years which was an even stranger place to be because i lived in the states for one year and then came back and after a little while i went into the military which is from there down over there to the uh, soldier life I, I heard many people complaining about the military it's like i want to like do my business i want to study and i have to go two years to the military but do you think it was a formative experience that's, that's the thing. Um, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of perspective, I would say. A lot of people, a lot of my peers during my military service would just sit there and uh, cross off days on the calendar from their lives and wait <laughs> until the two years passed so that they could continue, uh, continue their lives. A lot of people were very patriotic and were like, yes, I'm serving my country right now. I will do my best uh, and uh, I will spend these two years uh, to benefit my country. Uh, for a lot of people, it was just an interruption from their lives and um, you couldn't get much use out of that. For me, it was uh, different because seeing all of those things, I was like, I need to do something. Uh, so I um, I read a lot of books during my military service, um, a so huge you, plethora of how, books. How can I imagine being in the military? Like you, you wake up at four and go on a run? On Pretty much, yes. You wake up very early, get some exercise and then go uh, start your day of trainings and exercises and more trainings and more exercises uh, of uh, military education and so on. Uh, physical exercises, uh, shooting and so on. And I was just an ordinary soldier. I wasn't anything special, which was uh, 
another different interesting story. But yeah, so um, and then in the evenings when you have some free time, thankfully I was able to get some books and uh, read up and educate myself further, which was very nice. So, and this contributed also to your further career? Did you follow up then with the um, foreign languages education? Yeah, yeah, of course, most of the books I read, I tried to make them in English mm. or Russian so that I don't forget those languages in the two years and so on and professional stuff and things like that. So, after finishing my two-year military service, I continued my education in the uh, Yerevan State University. I finished uh, my bachelor's degree due some, to some disagreements with my, uh, with my department. Uh, I didn't continue my master's degree there and I still haven't done my master's degree to my shame. I think eventually I'll start working on that too. Eh, we'll see. But then, uh, and then I um, started learning uh, art management. Mm. Since well, I was, um, I was uh, all of my beautiful illusions about becoming a lecturer were <laughs> broken down into pieces after seeing what the university is from the inside, and it's a pretty bad and corrupt system. It still is in Armenia, and it needs a lot of change. But uh, so does this tie back to the years of petty corruption, or is a very different phenomenon? Yeah, I, I would tie it to the petty corruption, big corruption. I mean, a lot of people would just pay money and get diplomas. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Um, a lot of the lecturers were uninterested because of the very low salary that they would receive. Yeah, and, uh, that's the wrong approach because I think education is the one good quality that can help a country like leapfrog forward. Yes, it does um, if people are happy. If they're not, a lot of people start uh, finding other ways, and uh, and of course they're not when they're not happy. They don't involve themselves in their work, so and it becomes a routine. What happened after you finished your art management? Um, so I, I finished my art management education and uh, I got a job at the Highfest International Theatre Festival in Armenia, which was a very, very good experience for me, working with international theatres, bringing them to Armenia, organizing this very beautiful festival and um, working with uh, very good people and organizing beautiful events. So which would, uh, the goal was to raise the awareness and the scope of the local theaters mm -hmm. by having the chance to watch professional, uh, professional theaters perform in Armenia and having workshops and master classes and so on during the festival. It was a very good stuff. I worked there for four years probably, maybe a bit longer. Uh, if you can, if I add the years that I volunteered, for two years I volunteered there, and then fortunately I got a job mm -hmm. there uh, and worked, which was lots of fun. After four years, um, I felt quite sat satisfied with my work and uh, decided to move on uh, to other job opportunities. And I was fortunate enough to have seen uh, Sevan's talk, uh, Sevan's TEDx talk. Mm -hmm. He had a talk on TEDx and um, I saw him, I was very interested by what he was saying and uh, his talk was about uh, the look, uh, the how we see Armenia and the negativity, the positivity. So Just look at countries that want to be successful. Do any of them carry a negative narrative? Of course not. Don't you think they had their own issues and challenges throughout their histories? Of course they had. But countries that want to inspire always create corresponding narratives. A couple of examples. Land of opportunity. The American dream. Now, all else, all else aside, these are words that carry an attitude. Even in times of economic downturn, recession, depression, foreclosures, unemployment, traffic jams. These are words that make people believe first in themselves and then in their surroundings. Words that create a winning 
attitude? I think that was about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. So it wasn't for you like a critical moment where you like felt a connection to Armenia, saying I want to somehow be part of that change? Yes, yes. And Sevan talking about positivity and looking at Yerevan and Armenia in a positive way. Um, kind of piqued my interest and I looked up Sevan and saw Birthright Armenia and I was following it for a while and then fortunately I saw the job opening of, mm -hmm. uh, of the operations specialist. I applied and uh, luckily uh, I got the job which I've been happily doing for the past seven years. Oh, that's quite a long time. So yeah. you feel like very like well-rounded, accepted and purposeful here. Yes, I do. So what do you think, uh, like why is it a good place to work and what does this organization where you work um, do for Armenia? First of all, um, make sure that the bond between Armenia and diaspora is strong. That's one thing that is very good to have because a lot of uh, good things come from diaspora and I think that a lot of the development in the future is going to happen thanks to diaspora because all of these young Armenian guys uh, go abroad and see new things, learn new things which unfortunately a lot of the people in Armenia don't have the opportunity to see and they bring those things in Armenia, into Yerevan, into Armenia, Vanadzor and Gyumri and Artsakh and the local people learn and see a lot of new things thanks to that. It's, uh, it's beneficial to both sides and that's why I love Birthright Armenia because uh, we teach each other a lot of stuff. And so you pointed out really to the diaspora. Um, and there's this big question of the diaspora also becoming assimilated, mm -hmm. especially say in the US or Singapore. Um, and how can we keep an assimilated diaspora engaged? By bringing them here. That's, what, that's exactly what we're doing. And the more they assimilate, the more new things they will learn, in my opinion. But no, if they assimilate in their country, they move to, they will lose the connection to Armenia. Well, that's, that's the job of Birthright Armenia and those people, to keep the connection. So if they are quite assimilated but they still keep the connection to their country to their roots and they come every now and often now every now and then and teach things to the armenian younger generations and learn things from armenia i think that makes a perfect perfect mix of a human being that knows both sides and can interact well with both sides so that makes me wonder could you possibly share with us one experience that deeply touched your emotional mm -hmm. here at um, ABC Busworth? Sure, there are many experiences like that. Most of them, of course, connected with volunteer experiences. It's just very interesting to see the stages that the volunteers go through during their stay in Armenia, because of course it's hard, it's difficult. Me being a person who has also left my country and went to the States mm -hmm. for a year and lived there, I know vaguely what they go through because it's uh, it's different, but also it's the same. Going into a new yeah. environment, you go in there, you sit there, and you're like, "What the, what am I doing here?" Uh, and a lot of people ask themselves that question, and I think that's the very important question to have an answer to. And you can't answer that question sitting in your comfort zone and uh, drinking coffee. Uh, in order to have a good answer to that question, you need to get out of your comfort zone, get out of your country and uh, see new things, learn new things, so that you can have a, an opportunity to uh, have a wider range of um, So you say it's things. bilateral street, learning from the diasporas and uh, diasporans learning from Armenians. But then how do you see what should the new generation do? Do you recommend the master to spend one or two years, say, in a different country, in a foreign country, Absolutely. and then come back? Or? Yes. The more things you see, the, the yeah. bigger your brain gets. Let's uh, Roughly, let's say agree. that. If you visit more countries, if you meet more people, the more open your mind will be to new things, and your open mind will be 
and you can share that with other people. That's why I liked the program that I went to the States too, and uh, I was able to learn new things. And then when I came back, I would share uh, all of that. And because you want to share, you have yeah. learned a lot of new things. And when you learn something new, you're like, yeah. guys, you know this new thing. I, I, I got this. Curiosity. And yes, curiosity. curiosity. And in general, if, if you travel to a poor country, you learn humility. If you tra travel to a rich country, you learn how cool life is in other countries. <laughs> and then and then you start valuing some things in your country that that rich country doesn't have. Yes. I'll give you one example. For example, um, several years ago, probably eight, eight, nine years ago, uh, I was in a marshutka going from home to my work and a lady opened the door and put a small child into the bus, into the marshutka, into the bus, and said that, uh, could you help the kid get off at this station? Mm -hmm. And she closed the door. And the kid sat and it just, and it was a small kid. And I don't know, maybe like eight, nine years no, old. Okay. Or something. Uh, and the, the state, his, his bus station came and of course some people helped him and the kid had a small 100 gram coin in his hand, gave it to the driver um, and they opened the door and just left. And I was sitting there amazed, I'm like, in what other country would you see that? A mother leaving their child alone with like 20 strangers. They were from the diaspora. Cheche, they were Armenians. She was Armenian. But, uh, okay. And left her child. Uh, no, and because I totally see where you come from. Armenian have very strong family bonds. Yes, and they have this trust even to strangers mm -hmm. for the for them to make sure that the child gets to the destination. Mm -hmm. And it was a very big uh, revelation for me. And I realized that I've seen this in many other places, many other cases in Armenia where people do really genuinely take care of each other, and they care. And which is not the case in many countries outside of Armenia. I've seen a lot of the opposite of that in the States, mm -hmm. people not caring at all. I've yeah. seen that in France, that they just don't care about other people. I've seen that in Russia too, unfortunately, when I uh, went to Moscow. And uh, there are very, very few places who still have that genuine people caring about other people. And, uh, and that's when you start valuing the security in Armenia that you can, you, that you don't worry about that. For example, uh, if I, I asked a friend of mine who lived in France, in Paris, would he be able to do that? He would say that I would never see my child again. <laughs> if I did that, I would never see my child again. He would get kidnapped or something like that or worse. And uh, it was very, I was very proud for that, for that Armenia has and still keeps that uh, camaraderie. Yes, camaraderie and care and uh, genuine niceness to each other. Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, Very important to grow together. In mm -hmm. identity. Yeah, if you see all of these difficult times together, you start helping each other and making sure that everyone has a bright future. So let's talk a little bit about your perspectives and um, yes, you are a wonderful um, example of a post-Soviet Union personality. Mm -hmm. What were the really the biggest changes of your lifetime that occurred in Armenia? Biggest changes? Yes, like what, what really changed how people saw it, how people interacted and just the the narrative of the country. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say there was a like a big shift at mm -hmm. some point. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a slow process for me because I've lived here, and I've lived through, and will live through, and have lived through the process. I don't think there was a like a big whoop. There, this thing moved here, or this mm -hmm. big change. Um, there were some small things like changes in government and so on and things like that. But usually it was a very, very slow process of people uh, growing as a, as a nation and uh, learning and growing and so on and learning to behave, learning to uh, adapt to the new times, uh, learning to adapt to the new geopolitical situation after the Soviet Union. 
learning to adapt to the uh, new work system and work ethics because before in the Soviet times the work ethic was completely different yeah. and then it completely shifted and uh, there was a different work ethic, work pace and so on. All of that changed. So it was a very interesting and it still is of course a very interesting process of people changing, learning and adapting to the to the flow of time and change. So uh, maybe like um, take out the work ethics and understand how did this particularly change? And because I see in a way um, it's still moving, it's still mm -hmm. transitioning. Yeah, it's still transitioning. Um, again, if uh, we take, for example, the work in Soviet times, there were mostly factories, not, uh, and people would be uh, Five year after plan. after yeah and plans and things like that and and that's one of the good things that I think that was in the Soviet Union was that if you receive your higher education and you're finished your university education you are guaranteed a job which is something wonderful if you ask me mm -hmm. which no other country has been able to replicate uh, but in Soviet Union, that was the thing. Everyone knew that if you graduated your university, uh, you were guaranteed a job. And depending on the marks that you got, if you got higher marks, you uh, would get yeah. a job, let's say, if you are an engineer, in an enge if you studied as an engineer oh. and you born, you would start work, if you had high marks, you would start working in Moscow or in central oh, places. Okay. So you, you were sent around. Yes. If you had lower marks, you would be in, I don't know, Dane some Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or in some yeah. other fringe or in Armenia, you'd be get sent to Armenia. So, uh, or you would send to a village or Yerevan or central place. But still you were guaranteed a job, pretty much. Uh, which was a very good thing for people to have, which is the safety of knowing that if they study, they will have a job. If they don't, they have to learn some other craft to be able to live uh, and earn a living. Um, and that was a good thing, but also uh, it uh, made people slightly yeah, lazy. Relaxed. Yeah, they relaxed. Um, so after the change, everyone was like, what the hell are we going to do? Sorry for my language. Uh, and people were uh, left without knowing what will they, they will be able to do. First of all, a lot of education was based on the factories that they will be working on, industrial stuff mm -hmm. and things like that. But a lot of that disappeared. question before we move onwards. So what you say, let's take um, emigration out of the equation, but as in Soviet Union times, and people were more likely to go travel to another country and come back than say from 1990 to 2010? Yes. Well, first of all, there was the, all of the Soviet area was open. You could travel for vacations and things like that. And people really took it <coughs> Yes, very much. For example, if you ask any person from the, who knows of the Soviet times of Russia, Sochi, ooh, mm -hmm. that was the big vacation spot. Uh, <laughs> you work hard and then go to Sochi to have some rest and spend some time. Um, and uh, my parents' generation grew up on that. If, you, if I would ask my mother what was one of your best memories, she would say when my father and mother took a vacation and we went to Sochi. And people would travel a lot. Of course, they wouldn't travel outside of the Soviet Union but because it was so Iron Curtain and stuff like you that. You know the author Albert Camus? And he said, like, he, well, he lived in the 1930s, uh, somewhere there. Mm -hmm. And one, like, a statement of him that stuck with me is, like, to have history, you have to travel. You mm -hmm. have to see new. Yeah. And earlier we talked about the different generational divides. But I think this also starkly contributes to that, mm -hmm. that the Soviet generation had different perspectives, could interact with different countries, like, okay, one, one country. Here's the thing, it was a different country, but it was also the same thing. Yeah. For example, 
the things we have we had in our house would be the same all around Soviet mm. Union. If if I, when I see like now old photos of Ukrainian homes, mm. I would see the same things that we had in our home, like uh, I don't know vases, clocks, some parts of the uh, furniture and stuff like that. All of that was generally made for the whole Soviet Union. It was a good system because it provided for the whole Union, but then. Uh, everyone lived on the same level and you would say, uh, for example, it was very similar. So it was a different country, uh, but it wasn't too. And uh, since there was this whole Iron Curtain thing and you couldn't leave the Soviet Union, it was pretty much isolated. So it wasn't like people could travel anywhere they wanted. Within the Soviet Union, yes, we, you could go to Czechoslovakia and so yeah. on and things like that. But... Uh, it was also limiting too. And so going back to the development of the work ethics. In Soviet era times, a little bit lags, whether you were good or bad. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it wouldn't change your position much. Yeah. And suddenly, bang, 1991, some sunny September day, Kach mm Petrochun. -hmm. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, how did the narrative change? How did the mindset change? Well, that's the thing. The narrative changed that uh, almost all of the factories closed down immediately. Fortnite. Because uh, in the Soviet system, the factories worked like, um, like a huge machine. So factories in Armenia would build one part. Factories in Ukraine would build some other part of the car, let's say. And factories in uh, Kazakhstan would assemble that yes, stuff. Yes, yes, yes. So imagine if that whole system, uh, it breaks down. And now we have a factory that produces, I don't know, car tires, which are useless. <laughs> it produces rubber material, which is useless now. And all of these factories, unfortunately, closed down. And they were unable to do any work because they had very limited scope of uh, mechanical abilities. For example, I'll bring an exact example. My family, almost all of my family worked in the clock factory. It, it used to be near Komitas. And uh, as part of the very good Soviet system, we received a home next to the factory, free of charge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and all of my family worked there. My, grandfa my grandfather was a metal worker. He would make the metal parts. My grandmother was an engineer and, uh, and she would design and work on some little parts of the clocks that mm. they were making. My aunt was a, um, how do you call them? Anyway, she was making schematics and so on mm. for plans and so on. Exactly. And my fa father was, uh, uh, was not working in the factory. So, uh, so almost all of my family worked in the clock factory. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, of course, the factory was not receiving anything, any materials or sending out any materials. No, and it just closed line. down. Broke collapsed. Down. So all of these people who know these specific jobs in this specific uh, factory, they, left, they were left without jobs. Okay, do you think there was a new way of entrepreneurship rising up or did it really take a longer time? It took a longer time. A lot of people, a lot of, if you ask now, some of the taxi drivers that take you places, they will say that they have an engineer's master's degree in a very important Soviet university, mm -hmm. but they're working as taxi drivers. A lot of people who had very good education became uh, basic workers and so on and stopped working with their own profession. And that was, uh, and that's what happened. So you think in a way if we leapfrog to today, it's a lost generation? They never retrained, reskilled? Yeah. It's basically a lost. Some of them were able to mm -hmm. retrain themselves or start doing a different thing or use something that they learned to uh, work on something else. But a lot of people just lost years of their life, years of studying, years of practice, years of work hours spent learning their craft 
for them not to be able to do anything else afterwards. You know, it's, that's possibly a difficult question. From a policy perspective, do you think we should focus on the lost generation, helping to retrain, reskill them, or providing ample opportunities for the new generation? Hmm, very good question. I don't know, if, uh, if you think a bit radically, I would say that it's already the lost generation and the <laughs> lost. I'm saying this with pain because yes. even, I mean, my father is like that and he's from the lost generation and he didn't get to do a lot of things that he was planning to do. Um, But wait, please, that's very interesting, actually. Can, can you tell me, um, being his son, is it like also a mental blockade that he says, oh, I don't really want to go again to school or this, or it's just really there is, even if he's ambitious, there's no one really interested in like giving him a helping hand, providing him a job, finding an opportunity that fits a skill set. It's uh, it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. So there there are some who manage to go through that and learn something new. And a lot of people, a lot of people you see outside mm -hmm. uh, were unable to go over that barrier. And they're like, all of the things I learned and now it's gone and I can't do anything else. And they're mentally so, just So, I mean, then out. it's also the 1994 war, um, and so it's just exhausted. Yeah. They yeah. just want to settle down, they, they are... At yeah, they have, they, at some point they're like, ugh. Uh, yeah, I understand. And, uh, and that's the thing that, um, there are a lot of things that affected Armenia, and, and that's why we're falling behind. For example, I was in Georgia a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I was so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I was also in Georgia. Yes, and you see all of these things that they're moving forward, and at a f unfortunately at a faster pace than Armenia, and are a couple of decades ahead of us. Uh, I say that, and I'm like, ah, why? But I understand all of the things that... Uh, But I think Georgia is much more a question that Georgia um, very from early on they said we want to move towards the European Union. Yeah. They much earlier signed relevant agreements. Armenia just 2017 I think they signed in like accession agreements. Or mm -hmm. something yeah, like we're that. slow. And um, it's in a way also a geopolitical issue. Mm -hmm. But I think. Armenia has good potential to move forward because Georgia doesn't have such an engaged and professional diaspora. Mm -hmm. And Armenia has now a young generation that wants, wants to change their future. Look at yes. you now. Yes, and that's exactly this one, uh, and that's one of the small differences between Armenia and Georgia. Uh, and it's a good thing that it's going to drive people forward. Uh, but also people need to be more open-minded to that. Um, a lot of uh, the older generations need to start uh, being a little more open-minded towards all of the new things. Okay, so I think there's one question that burns on all of our tongues. Do you believe the Velvet Revolution was just another event stirring some emotion and then it's moving along? Or it was revolutionary that changed the way we think, talk, and act. Mm. I'm not, I mean, it's my personal opinion. Mm. Yeah, it's that's uh, why you're here. for that's me. Why you're it here. was, um, and we take out all of the conspiracy theories out of the <laughs> out of the conversation because there are too many and i'm a conspiracy theory guy so uh, i think it was um it could have been so much more i think the velvet revolution could have been so much more than it is right now and uh, it's a lost opportunity that they just let it happen and then just it is just another small event that happened throughout history It could have been so much more. It could have done so much yeah, more. It could have cho changed so much more. There was so much momentum and so much happiness. And then we just settled down for just 
one sentence, we had Velvet Revolution and then pretty much everything continued in the same place. Okay, that brings us to the point. You're Armenian, you work with uh, thousands of the new generation, helping them get um, f f find a landing ground, a landing site. What do you think, what do we need to do for a prosperous future? What advice can you give the new generation? Where do you see Armenia moving? The advice is being open-minded and learning new things. Again, it's not um, it's not an intersection that we're like, if we go left, it's going to be different. And if we go right, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. The Armenian people have existed thousands of years. 4,500, I think. 4,500 yeah. years. We have had uh, a very long path and we still have a long path ahead of us. And it's just uh, ups and downs and just one road forward. And it just depends on Armenian people how fast are we able to adapt to the new uh, new times because that's what Armenians have been doing throughout these 4,500 really, years. It's the question of the people. It's not the government. Not che, the, che, the, gov the government is the same uh, poop everywhere. Every other country you ask, oh, the government is this. We yeah, have we have you, Trump. We have we, Putin. We have that this we and that. We have to be very clear on that. Yes. Because if we are not clear, and people are like, okay, let, let's just survive every day, and somehow it'll be good. But if people are more aware, then they're the ones that can change their narrative. I think yeah. then you accelerate. Yeah. Progress. I mean, we Armenians know that better than probably anyone else, because we've been here for quite a long time and we've seen the government change billions of times. Yes. I mean, the, the Velvet Revolution, the revolution previous years, the first Armenian independence, the third Armenian country, the Soviet Armenia. There have been so many changes like that throughout Armenian history that we already know that it's the people who keep the country going. It's the people who keep the nationality going and the people who live in the diaspora, they already know, they also know that they are the people who continue Armenian history. They're part of the history and they're going to continue it. They are Armenian and despite what anyone tells them, they are Armenian and that's, that's the direction Armenia is going, towards the bright future. So, being open-minded, Yes. travel abroad, come back, share your experience. Absolutely. And stay true to your roots? Is yes, like... stay true to your roots. Okay. You perfectly summed it up. <laughs> Hi, really, I think we had a very insightful, thought, provocative conversation. Thank you very much. That will help others uh, join the thought framework and uh, I hope it will put go to action mm -hmm. for a bright future yes thank you very much it's thank my you. pleasure you're my pleasure too